Thank you very much, Alex. So, uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Simon 18. I'm an engineer for NLNet Labs, um, a colleague of Alex. Um, I'm going to talk to you tonight about uh, packaging for the masses. Uh, let's get straight in to see what that is. Firstly, though, a little bit of summary. Um, how did we get here? This isn't something we actually intended to build or even to share with anyone else. It, we had a need. As Alex said, we didn't find what we needed at the time. We started off small, it grew, it got bigger, it got more messy, we tidied it up, we wanted to use it on more projects, we made it reusable, and kind of by accident made, realized it was then usable by anyone else using, who is using GitHub, that is. Um, and just, I'll just say this up front right now. Most of it, in fact, nearly all of it is independent of GitHub. So there's, if somebody really is interested later and they want to contribute to the project and help out, maybe the whole concept of what it does and how it does it can be taken out and used for Travis or something else. But I can, yeah, if you wish. I have some notes there, though. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll cope. Um, so yeah, we, we cleaned this thing up, we gave it a name, and we thought this is a perfect opportunity to share it. We find it useful. So if we find it useful, presumably other people will as well. Or you will tell us why it's a really bad idea and you should not be doing this at all, and what on earth were you thinking? And we're equally interested in both points of view. <laughs> so, like I say, this thing kind of evolved. So. Um, without further ado, I have a strange question for you, because, of course, you all know the answer. Well, I hope you all know the answer to this question. What is Rust? Obviously, it, it's the language, but that surely that's not everything. We know that's not everything, because you write your Rust code, but that doesn't end up on people's systems. That doesn't end up on servers or embedded devices and run. You have to compile that code. Somebody has to compile that code. Um, Sure, Rust is nice and easy. People can clone your repo, do a git uh, clone. They can do a cargo build. You can even cut that step out and do cargo install. But they still need to have Rust and cargo and whatever other compile time dependencies installed on their system in order to do that. And you probably don't want to ask people to do this on a server or on a single board computer like a Raspberry Pi. You know, the servers, it's serving. It's doing something for a reason. Um, sure, maybe you've got a hot spare, you've got a cluster, you could do them one by one at a time, but we all know that whilst Rust is great for low CPU usage and low memory usage when it's running your compiled application, it's slow and CPU intensive to compile. Uh, you don't want to do that on your server. And if you've got a cluster of servers, why would you compile it n times on each one? You don't. Likewise, if you've got a Raspberry Pi or some other small device, and Sure, your thing will run with very low memory, very low CPU, but it will get very hot and take a long time and get very upset whilst it's compiling. I actually killed my Raspberry Pi 4B <laughs> compiling <laughs> Krill on it. Now, some of that fault is my own. You shouldn't have used the case that I had on it, but <laughs> Raspberry Pi is like air. But they also don't really like rust. So <laughs> um, but even if you get past that step, you know, an application is not just a binary. Now, many of you maybe are writing libraries, so this doesn't so much apply. But if you're writing an application, you've got config files, you've got man pages, you've got additional assets, you've got uh, maybe you want it to be a system service that started and stopped, you need to create user accounts, directories, I don't know what. So this is where packaging, of course, comes in. And I hope I'm not telling anybody anything new here, just setting the scene a little. Um, I'm talking about binary packages here, not source packages, by the way. So you've, you're a Rust uh, programmer, or you work with a team that has a Rust product, and you've decided you want to package it. I'm talking here about um, the kinds of things that we at NLNet Labs for our Rust projects needed to target. So that's uh, Debian packages, uh, that's uh, RPM packages, and that's uh, Docker images. Um, Docker is actually theoretically very easy. You just stick a Docker file in your GitHub repository and you go to Docker Hub and you say, please build it for me. And it will go and check that out and it will well, clone it, build it, turn it into an image and publish it for you. At least in theory. 
We used to do that. We don't do it anymore. It was horribly slow. It was very unreliable. Sometimes it would just not do anything at all. Um, we, as we found that we wanted to build more package types more for more CPU architectures, uh, we stopped using Docker Hub coincidentally about the same time as we started building other package types. Um, but if you want to build Debian packages or RPMs, you can say, hey, why don't you use Cargo Dev? I know at least one person here uses it. I spoke to them about it earlier, or has used it. Um, and there's Cargo Generate RPM. You know, one of the great things about Rust is, although it's not that old, there's a, quite a lot of stuff out there already. Um, but we found that, sure, Cargo Deb, nice. It will compile your code. You give it some configuration in Cargo Toml, um, and out comes a Debian package. But it's not actually quite that simple. If you then run Lintian, the Debian package linter, on the package, it will just scream at you. This package, it, it may look like a dev package, but this does not meet the expectations for a dev package. And you have to do a bit more work to overcome that. Um, we also, uh, there was no help with system D uh, unit uh, installation and correct startup and shutdown. I actually contributed that back to Cargo Deb. It's one of the things I love about working on Rust that I'm contributing back to the projects that we use. Uh, Cargo Generate uh, has even less. Uh, it's a very thin wrapper around RPM RS. Um, and you can get a long way with these things, but you do that, you set it up in one project, and then you need to do it in another project, and then you need to do it in another project, and you end up doing some, solving some of the same problems in each case. Um, then, for example, you think, hey, Cargo Deb will do cross-compilation for me, but Cargo Generate RPM doesn't, and that doesn't help you with the Docker case. So you want to extract that out and handle it differently. So this was great, but we needed wanted a bit more. It, it's also very different if you're an enterprise with thousands of engineers. We're very small. We want to spend our time writing the Rust code, not dealing with this other stuff. So um, we're trying to automate and simplify as much as we can so that we can just forget about it and move on. Um, so we created something that we've recently named Plutos. We, we needed a name. So <laughs> uh, talking about it as the GitHub NLNet Labs reusable Rust packaging workflow was just too many words. So <laughs> we named it Plutos. And it doesn't really do anything original. It, original. it doesn't really do anything special. It doesn't do anything that you can't do yourself. Um, but it does automate for us the task of building and Debian, RPM packages, and Docker images. And also, more importantly, actually installing them, testing that they install, that they upgrade, that they uninstall, and running a bunch of application-specific tests against those as well afterwards, and running the official linters, whether that be uh, Lintian or RPM lint, uh, against those uh, packages. Do, do they meet expectations? We found numerous problems there because of that. Um, and it basically does this. If none of you have, if you haven't seen GitHub Actions before, it's a automation pipeline, and this is the visual side of it in the web UI, um, just basically showing that some things happened in parallel: Docker packaging, OS packaging, so Debian RPMs, and uh, cross compilation, and then afterwards some testing. And in this case, no manifest pa publication, but it can do that. I don't want to explain how GitHub Actions works or workflows. I can tell you lots afterwards if you're interested. Um, the previous project uh, at NTPD, they, NTP by Twade at Golf, they did mention that they're using GitHub. I don't know how many of you are. Could maybe a show of hands? Right, that's pretty clear. And how many of you are already doing this kind of packaging for yourselves? Some of you, OK. Um, yeah, Plutos does that so that users can do this. This is our Routinator documentation. The box at the top of that stack over there is Routinator, one of our products. And we have documentation saying, you know, install it on Debian like this, or Ubuntu, CentOS, RHEL, Docker. This is uh, because we build it, we can just easily tell people to go and install it. I should state, however, Plutos does not publish your packages anywhere or host them for you. It does in the case of Docker to Docker Hub, because that's fairly easy. We have a separate in-house solution for how we sign, publish, and host packages. But if you're fairly small scale, you can actually even just stick them in a GitHub repository yourself. We even do that for the Plutos testing framework. Um, 
So Plutos doesn't yet cover publication. M maybe we could do that. With, it's a matter of resource and interest. We don't currently need it. Um, so that the developers can focus on the Rust code. And I'm actually going to show you this. Or at least I am if nothing goes wrong. You know, everyone knows what live demos are like. And if you want, you can try it yourself. So there's uh, NLNet Labs on GitHub. We have a Plutos repository. And inside that is a template directory. Quick word of warning, um, it will spawn lots of jobs in parallel on GitHub Actions. Now, GitHub Actions is free. Um, but if you're using a private repository not visible to the world, then you only have so many free credits before you run out of those, and then you're stuck unless you pay. So uh, if you use this in a private repository, be warned. Um, this is how I'm going to give the little example, the demo. Um, if you don't know Cargo Hatch, it's like Cargo Generate. If you don't know Cargo Generate, it's Cargo New on steroids. If you don't know Cargo New, I should probably just give up. Um, <laughs> Uh, it will just take a, a, frame, a directory containing some templates with placeholders and create a local copy of those, uh, having filled in those placeholders after asking you some questions. It's just a quick and easy way for me to give you a demo. Uh, we're going to generate a local uh, a project, a, a Hello World Rust project, with packaging configuration. We're going to push that to GitHub. That will trigger GitHub Actions to do its thing. Uh, we're going to well, I'm going to show you some more slides. Drinking a coffee might be more fun, but you know we have to wait a while. And then before the talk is over, it will have finished. Uh, the first time it runs takes longer because it has to pre-install some tools that don't exist yet. After that, they are cached. And the second time, it's faster. Uh, no, that's too far. Right, now wish me luck. <laughs> so. Um, where is my... Yeah, this is why we test things beforehand and everything's fine and now we can't see what we need. Ah, getting there. Hello. Why is that not doing the right thing? Right, um, this is the GitHub repository I was just pointing to. Uh, referring to. Uh, let me make that a bit larger. Um, we're using Cargo Hatch instead of Cargo Generate because Cargo Hatch has one feature that Generate doesn't and because Generate fails to actually work on my project. I have an open issue with them. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, run Cargo Hatch, point it with Git keyword at the repository at GitHub, tell it to use the template subdirectory where the template is and to create a local project with a given name. And then we're going to add the files that were generated to Git and commit them and then push them. And we're going to push them up to this empty repository that's waiting there. It's deliberately not in the NLNet Labs organization to show that this works across different GitHub organizations and users. This is a completely empty repository that has one thing in it. I have created a GitHub action secret called Docker Hub token with a access credential, access token credential so that I can actually, in the demo, publish to Docker Hub. And here is the Docker Hub repo waiting for us that doesn't exist yet. And we hope that this all starts to look more interesting in a minute. And now I have to just switch to something else. There we go. Right, so. Let's do that. Not testing, but is this, do I need to make it bigger? Okay, not 30, right. All right, so this will ask a few questions. Uh, one of the things that uh, Cargo Deb by four and, and Cargo Generate RPM need to know is a license, otherwise the linters will complain that your project is not valid. Um, I'm just going to stick with the default for now. Um, I'm going to build all possible package types, Deb, RPM, and Docker. I'm going to uh, tag the image with my Docker uh, repo name, and I'm going to call it nov30. And I'm going to use my user to uh, publish. Did I type that right? I did. And let's also, for the hell of it, put some uh, cross-compilation in for some embedded, uh, well, not embedded, but single board uh, computer targets. And it's finished, uh, generating the repo, that is, locally. So if we have a look at this, 
we have some files. Um, if we look at uh, Cargo Tomel, it's fairly uninteresting. It's just a fairly basic Cargo Tomel file. Um, you'll see some metadata for Cargo Deb and some metadata for Cargo Generate RPM. You can do way more than this. This is just a, a starting point. If you look at our Routinator or Krill uh, projects, which all build using this, by the way, they're a lot more uh, exercising a lot more capabilities. Um, but these are the minimum things needed to get the linters to be happy. And the real interesting bit is the workflow file that it's generated. Um, and you can see this says it's using the NLNet Labs Plutos workflow, the PKJ Rust YAML version 5. I've been doing lots of work on this over the last months. Uh, it's using my Docker uh, logging details, publishing to my Docker uh, repository that I mentioned. There's some build rules here that it's just generated based on my questions uh, for Docker targets to build for, and then also for Ubuntu, Debian, and CentOS. Um, you can use these on compatible systems as well, and also a couple of cross-compilations uh, requested there as well for Debian Bullseye and Debian Buster uh, for the, uh, those two target platforms, Raspberry Pi, 4B, and Rock64. So rather than let me get this wrong, let me copy-paste before I do the next bit. Okay. Yeah, I saw that. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, let me see the add orange in. I can just fix that up here from what I did earlier. Testing. Guess what I was doing earlier? <laughs> uh, yep. And then oh, I'm missing a G as well. It's just not my day. Yay! We have an internet connection. Something did something. So if we refresh the repository page, we find we now have a repo. And if we go to GitHub Actions, we see that there is a job running. And if we click on that, we'll see already it's getting still in the prepare phase. It's just checking the inputs and stuff. And come on, that bit's usually fairly quick. Here we go. And now it starts spinning up the other jobs, these are all running in parallel. So we see there's cross-compilation, there's packaging for different operating systems, and, uh, oh, it's gone off the bottom now, but there was the Docker image uh, compilation, well, compilation and creation as well. These steps all happen in parallel. Um, how does this work? Where's the pointy thing on this? Which one? That one? Thanks. So um, we've got Docker compilation here. We've got packaging uh, for Debian and RPM here. And we've got, um, sorry, this is the cross. Top one's Docker, packaging, cross. If the Debian and RPM packaging needs a cross-compiled binary, it will wait until this is finished. Likewise, if the Docker needs to produce a cross, uh, include a cross-compiled binary, it will wait. Uh, when the packaging has finished, it will uh, take those packages and install them in LXC containers of the right operating system and actually test that they install. If you have an externally published previous version, you can configure it to upgrade against that version. It will uninstall, reinstall, run application-specific tests against it. Um, and over here, if uh, you built um, a Docker image for multiple different architectures, uh, then it will create a manifest and publish that directly as well. And that allows you to, as a user, just run it without knowing which CPU architecture you need. You don't need to specify it in your request. So we're going to leave this running and come back to it. And then afterwards, if I have time, I will show it working. But it looks like I might not. <laughs> mm, anything else to show here? No, let me just move on. Uh, ba -ba 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 There we go. Yeah, so um, coming back, why did we build this? If you look at our Unbound and NSD products, sorry, I'm pointing at the cubes over here, but the two, the bottom half, our older products, we don't package those ourselves. So why would we package the Rust ones ourselves? Those have been around a lot longer. There's been, they're deployed all over the world. There are plenty of people out there who are willing to do the packaging work for us, and maybe even for official repositories for Ubuntu and Fedora and et cetera. But the Rust, Rust products we have are a lot newer. Um, 
and we're iterating on them a lot as well. So there's, the, there's no one stepping up to package them for us at the moment. And uh, there's also some pushback against the uh, packaging of Rust stuff based on concerns about a single large binary pulling in lots of stuff from crates I.O. This is not the way you should do it, according to some people. We're not going to get into that right now. Um, but suffice it to say, we were asked, people came to us and said, hey, can we have a Debian package? Can we have an RPM? Can we have a Docker image? And we just started with thinking, what can we offer? What can we not? Um, and yeah, it, it started off as a couple of simple shell scripts, and it grew, and it grew, and it grew, and you don't want to see what it grew into. It was horrible. And I, I basically got fed up of fixing the same bugs in four different repositories for whether it be Rootinator, Krill, Krill Sync, RTRTR, uh, the Rotunda stuff we have. I have to keep copying and pasting these things backwards and forwards between bits of GitHub workflow. It's painful. And then GitHub released reusable workflows. Um, and a bit later, they re released reusable workflows with matrix support. Now, we make heavy use of matrix support. That's the building lots of different uh, architectures and platforms in parallel. When they finally did this, I converted what I had into one thing I could maintain and edit and support and use and realized by accident it's suddenly workable for any, usable for anyone else because GitHub reusable workflows are reusable by anyone. So it's in a public repository, as I just did from a completely unrelated repository. You can do the same. You can, with a small YAML file with very few lines, say, please package my Rust Cargo application and give me Debian files, RPM files, Docker images. Um, of course, the more people that look at it, the more people who can come back and say to me, why did you do that? Please fix it. And we go, oh, I, I didn't realize that was wrong. Sorry. Yeah, we should fix that. Thank you. Um, or they benefit from it. So uh, either way, it's win-win. If, if nobody uses this, we still use it. We still need it until somebody tells us we should be doing something else. Um, but in the meantime, it, it's worked very well for us now over the last... I don't know how long, a year, a couple of years, maybe even longer, we've been packaging for Rootinator and, uh, and Krill. Uh, and this thing in one form or another has been used all that time. So, and the, the how, yeah, we, we already used GitHub Actions. I appreciate it's vendor lock-in, but since most of you use GitHub as well, I'm not really talking to the right audience to worry about vendor lock-in there, I think. Uh, but as I said, most of it is not GitHub specific, so we could possibly extract this and make it usable somewhere else. Um, we like to keep our Rust repositories fairly focused on Rust and not lo have lots of unrelated noise in there and have developers in each project have to learn how does the native tooling work. And then you also need a machine that has that tooling that can run it or a container or a VM. Um, it's also nice if we make use of existing stuff in the Rust community. We find issues with it and weaknesses, and we can contribute them back. And you know, we get so much from Rust, it's really nice if we can give something back. Um, and as I said, it's not really doing anything that special. It's rather a lot of... It's about a thousand lines long or something, but um, it's really just wrapping the uh, Rust-embedded uh, uh, group uh, cross-tool, Cargo Deb, Cargo Generate, RPM, and it's using the official linters, uh, lintian and RPM lint. And then it's just exercising the apt commands, the yum commands, the docker commands. It's just doing all of this stuff for you. It, it's boring but useful. And partly because I wanted to know that it worked, and partly because I didn't want to look really stupid when some of you guys try it and tell me it doesn't work, we have a separate repository called Plutos Testing, which unleashes a massive invocation of GitHub Actions. I think it's about 145, I think it's actually up to 170 parallel invocations uh, of uh, GitHub hosted runners, uh, running all kinds of variations of the stuff that you can build with this and testing them. So, uh, and you can, of course, look into that repo to see how the data files that's using. And we already have Rootinator and Krill and RTRTR and Krill Sync and soon some more projects that are using it as well. So there's plenty of real world examples of how it works. Um, but we're only a few people, so, and we don't really want to spend our time doing this, and we're not packaging experts. So we're doing the best we can. Honestly, we'd rather not be doing it. Um, and 
I've said here, don't use it in cr critical deployments. What I really mean by that is, if you're truly running critical systems, then we don't expect you to take anything that we build. We expect you to take the source code, have somebody else audit it, uh, package it yourself, know very tightly in control where you're getting stuff from and how you build that and what you're going to run. Um, now, that maybe only applies to very specific circumstances, but there are lots of other people and use cases, hey, they just want to build something that someone can run on their Pi, or they want to, uh, you know, the thing that they're packaging and publishing and is not that complicated, it's easy to verify. Or maybe even the biggest risk is actually in other places, like the supply chain, cut crates I owe, uh, whose dependencies are you using, are they maintained, are they safe? So is this really the biggest issue? Um, as I said, doesn't yet publish DevRPM, but we know how I can say more. Uh, by the way, we're using aptly for uh, our Deb package uh, repository management, and we publish, we store on S3, and it's fronted by AWS CloudFront. Uh, it does only what we needed, but if you want something else, PRs are welcome. And um, if, we, if you were to use native package tooling, the native Debian commands, the native uh, Fedora, Red Hat commands, you would have more functionality. You would probably have different bugs, because um, we're kind of reinventing a wheel, which is never a good thing. But we wanted to stay Rust, and we wanted to improve what's available to Rust community people. So, I think, as Alex keeps telling me I'm running out of time, that was the last slide. We can flick back quickly and see if I can get it to work. Oh, it's finished. If we scroll down here, uh, where's the mouse, where's the mouse? There, all at the bottom. There's a whole bunch of uh, outputs here. Uh, let me see, oh, the Docker one should already have been published. That will be the quickest for me to show. Let me refresh this. Uh, go to tags, which I thought I was on. We see here we have uh, multi different architecture images published and grouped under a single manifest called unstable. If I tag that GitHub repository, if I say create a release, say v1.0.0, .0, it will cause the actions to run again, the workflow, but you will get different tagged stuff in Docker Hub, and it will also properly tag your Debian packages or your RPM packages. Uh, likewise, if you're in development, your version number maybe should be newer than the latest one released, um, but when the final version of it is released, it should not be considered older than the next dev one and stuff like that. You have to manage these uh, things. It's uh, subtle, but you have to use a tilde instead of a, a dash and stuff like that. It's not even valid in a cargo toml file to use the kind of version number that you actually need for a proper Debian or RPN uh, uh, release candidate releases. But here we only built the unstable version. And if I am really lucky and quick, I can do a docker run nov30 unstable and it will pull and say hello world. <laughs> if we have time, I can show the Debian package works and I can show the RPM package works as well, but it's basically more of the same. So uh, how many time, we have what, two minutes for questions? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. And this will eat into your break. <laughs> well, shall I hand out one and you hand out the other? It, does anyone have a question? Oh, all the way at the back. It would be. Where? Uh, quick no is also acceptable. But have you looked, or has the project looked at OCI artifact uh, specification, or have you seen any other project look at it? No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Fair enough. Uh, I would think like the with all the standardization uh, going around with cosine to verify the supply chain and everything, this would be a valuable target to have. Um, yeah, we do separately for, so this is not everything we do for our projects. We also run cargo audit, we do eyeball checks on dependencies, we have certain standards we expect things to meet. Um, but yeah, you could obviously integrate more stuff into this as well. But do you want, really want to wait until the point where you produce packages where you find out certain things? You might want to run those checks earlier. 
Oh, no, I never wait. <laughs> Does anyone else have a question? Oh, I assume you were finished, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I know that maybe man. Maybe easy one, maybe not. Is, is it on? Okay, never mind. Uh, on the caveats, um, I have no idea about the differences between GitLab and GitHub, but would this somehow be, uh, let's say, adaptable to uh, to use the, the GitLab uh, facilities? Right, somebody actually asked me that question uh, a few weeks ago, I think. Uh, I think it happened on Twitter or Mastodon or something from Alex uh, mentioning stuff that we were doing. Um, I don't have any access to GitLab, so I can't tell you. But as I said, nearly everything this does is not GitHub specific. So um, especially the core parts. The GitHub specific parts are uh, building the matrix as input or passing the inputs that's given, pass, basically passing inputs and outputs around between the stages. Everything that happens in the stages is just shell commands and running Docker uh, containers because that's the way that GitHub Actions work. So I'm very hopeful it could be run somewhere else, but I can't say yes because I have no access. If you would care to share login credentials for me, for GitLab, I can tell you more, but I, I, it's a paid service, so I don't have access to that. Any more? Oh, Alex, the two minutes was easy. Oh. We didn't even need two minutes. <laughs> okay, so everybody go and try this out. And if you have contributions or, or uh, suggestions, then please let us know. Uh, we, we love doing this project uh, for the community. And we think it will be really useful. Uh, and that makes it a quarter past eight. It is time for